This is Physical Science 2, Chapter 21, Part 1 on the Earth's Changing Surface. In this portion of the video lecture, we will be discussing weathering and soil. In our last unit, we discussed how the rock cycle can continuously form and, and change rocks on the surface. And weathering plays a part in the rock cycle because it breaks down uh, material at or near the surface to make large uh, sediments into smaller sediments. So weathering can be either a physical or chemical breakdown of material at or near the surface. So a physical way uh, to break rock apart would be mechanical weathering. So literally prying the rock apart. Uh, so some forces that causes this uh, impact. Uh, over time, uh, a very large uh, outcrop of rock or a large boulder will have other smaller sediments getting uh, impacted on it because of the uh, wind uh, or in cases of water. Slowly, over time, every single impact that that rock receives from anything will break it down over time. Uh, another way to mechanically weather a rock is through the expansion and contraction otherwise known as the freeze-thaw cycle. Uh, water is a very interesting molecule uh, in the fact that it is one of the few molecules that actually uh, increase in size as it freezes. Uh, most things will shrink as they freeze. Water actually expands. Uh, and so in the springtime and the, uh, and the summer, we have water seeping down into the tiny little cracks and crevices of rock uh, and then when the weather and the seasons become colder, that water expands. And this cycle repeats every winter and spring. And so this constant expansion and contraction, or freeze-thaw, acts like an accordion and eventually breaks the rock apart. Uh, biological effects, uh, things like root wedging. Uh, trees, <clears throat> as they're growing into the soil, if they uh, hit underground rock, uh, can actually uh, grow through that rock and force the rock apart in that way. Uh, also for the effect that some plants uh, and uh, animal wastes uh, can deteriorate uh, rock itself just from the, um, just from the breakdown uh, of being in contact with that. Chemical weathering. Uh, chemical weathering is a little bit different from mechanical weathering. Because here we're actually going to get a new compound after the weathering is finished. So chemical weathering forms new compounds and releases elements into the environment. Uh, the key players here are water, uh, oxygen, and naturally occurring acids. Uh, we have naturally occurring acids uh, in uh, plants and animal wastes that can uh, slowly break down rock. Uh, water uh, is not, uh, at least natural water on the earth, is not always 100% uh, neutral. Sometimes it is, uh, most often it is very acidic, and so the acidity in there can wear down a rock. Uh, here we have two examples of some uh, famous historic icons. Uh, on the left side there we have the Parthenon in Greece, uh, and on the right side we have uh, the good old Statue of Liberty. Uh, mechanical and chemical weathering uh, have played a part uh, in, these, in these icons. Uh, mechanical weathering of the Parthenon, the, the uh, freeze-thaw cycle. Uh, weathering can break down uh, the columns and the roof of the Parthenon and have over uh, uh, many centuries. Also, the fact that acid rain can also break down the limestone that that building is built out of. So the Parthenon can have mechanical and chemical weathering occurring on it. The Statue of Liberty, however, uh, since that is made out of metal, uh, out of copper, we have uh, a green looking Statue of Liberty because the chemical weathering of copper uh, releases, uh, a new, uh, releases new elements into the environment. So the very surface of the copper has broken down uh, into a uh, material that we call patina, uh, and that's the green uh, sort of tinge that you see. Um, because of the exposure to water uh, and oxygen, the surface of the copper changes over time chemically. 
Uh, basically, we have mechanical and chemical weathering, so we can have soil. Uh, soil is a mixture of weathered rock, uh, organic matter, water, and air. We can take a look at the different soil horizons. Uh, these layers can be uh, any certain amount of thickness. It depends on a lot of different things for the area itself. But we'll start from the top all the way down. Uh, the very top layer is the O layer. O stands for organic. Uh, this is where a lot of the uh, little critters are crawling in the ground. We have uh, plants growing there with shallow roots. Uh, a lot of uh, decaying plant and animal matter will also be in this layer, which is why they call it the O layer. So O for organic. Below the O layer, we have uh, two layers, the A and the E layer. Uh, sometimes the O and the A layer are sometimes called the top soil. In order to grow crops, you need a top soil. So you need an organic layer and you need the A layer, uh, which is very mineral rich. And the reason why roots of plants are there is because they take the minerals out of the soil. The next two layers, the E and the B layer, uh, these are often called the subsoil. Uh, you need subsoil in order to grow topsoil, in order to grow crops. So the E layer, E stands for alluviation. Um, this is where leaching occurs in the soil. Alluviation, uh, you can kind of think of as like an elevator layer. So E for alluviation and E for elevator because the E layer brings up all of the minerals and leaches them from the very bottom uh, parts of the bedrock up to the layers of the topsoil. Uh, the B layer, this collects weathered material. Uh, so we are going to have uh, kind of larger sediments here. Uh, the sediments will be probably uh, sand or gravel sized in the B layer. The C layer has partially crumbled bedrock, bedrock. Uh, so C, you can remember C for crumbles. Um, most of the rock here uh, is split into very large chunks of gravel uh, or boulder or cobble size. And then the very bottom of soil, if you dig down far enough, you will eventually hit the R layer, which we call solid bedrock. So again, the top soil layers are the O and the A layer. We need those to grow crops or plants. The E and the B layer of the subsoil, we need that in order to build the topsoil. And the C and the R level, we need that in order to build the subsoil, in order to build the topsoil. Uh, there are different soil types uh, all over the world. Climate really characterizes different soil types. Um, because a climate has a particular temperature and precipitation range, certain types of vegetation will grow within that temperature and precipitation range. So that can also influence soil types, uh, as well as the original solid bedrock type. Different types of rock, bedrock can lead to different types of soils. Uh, soil is important. Uh, it's very important, of course, in the agricultural community since that's how we grow our food uh, and also feed the other food that we eat. Uh, soil depletion is a very serious agricultural problem in many regions. Uh, farmers have to protect from uh, flash floods, which can uh, take away their topsoil layers of the O and the A layer. Uh, we can also uh, take a look at wind erosion as well, which can also... Uh, take away the topsoil layers as well. So different things that uh, farmers do to keep their soil where it is. Uh, fertilization helps keep soil a little bit heavier uh, because you're adding more elements into that soil so the wind or the water may not be able to take it all away. Uh, also building things like wind breaks uh, along uh, stretches where there uh, is not a lot of tree cover uh, if there's a wide open field, they can build windbreaks in order uh, to uh, break up the wind so all of the soil doesn't blow away. Uh, also taking a look at different ways to uh, irrigate the water. 
uh, in uh, different canal systems. So in case of a flooding event, uh, the water has somewhere to go so it doesn't just sit on the field uh, or so it doesn't wash away the topsoil on the field as well. This has been Physical Science 2, Chapter 21, Part 1 on the Earth's Changing Surface.